in almost 10 years of ministry, I've done quite a few premarital counseling sessions. Even with many marriages now being destination or venue weddings, many Christians still see the value of talking to their preacher or a preacher before they head down the aisle. But with each of these sessions, I'm always surprised by the things that come up, or rather the things that don't come up in conversations that couples have before coming and sitting down in my office. So like the pastor who did mine and Amanda's counseling session, I try to ask questions that the couple needs to answer among themselves before they get married. Questions like, have you talked about children? Or have you talked about any financial issues like credit card debt or student loan debt? Or have you talked about church membership, attendance, tithing? That last one they never like. But at last, we, at least when we're, we're talking about this, they're usually on the same page most of the time when it comes to children and financial issues, debt. The vast majority of, of the couples I've talked to are open and honest about these dreams and, and struggles. But then I start asking them more detailed questions like, which one of you is going to pay the bills and primarily look over your finances? And I'll follow up with, have you had any discussions about separate or joint checking accounts? That's when they generally look at me like deer in the headlights. No, oh, gosh, should we have talked about that? Yes, you should have. You need to. There's not a right or wrong answer, but you need to know what you're going to do when you get married. You need to be in agreement on this. Eventually, we'll talk about work and careers, too, and their dreams for the future. And it's always remarkable how many couples haven't talked about their long-term career goals. You know, I would love to work in my company's Asian office one day. If my company ever offers me that job, I will probably take it. The groom-to-be's eyes got as wide as saucers. I'm sorry, what? You never mentioned that before. I I'm not opposed to that, but we should talk about that before we go any further. At the end of our sessions and counseling ses or conversations, before we move to actually planning the ceremony, I always ask them something like, what's come up? in the conversations outside of here that we need to talk about? What's been left unsaid? What have we missed? And normally, most couples will launch into questions about logistics or concerns they have about that one parent who might cause problems at the wedding. But one time, the bride-to-be looked right at me and said, you know those vows that we're going to say? Do we write them? And I said, no, normally we use the traditional ones from the book of worship. Okay, that's fine. But I have to ask, those vows don't have any of that obey nonsense in there, do they? Because I'm not going to say that. For the record, the word obey doesn't appear in our traditional vows anymore. And I think it's unfortunate that the word was ever in there to begin with. Not because it's unscriptural per se, but because they only put it in the bride's vows. The problem here is twofold. First, obey isn't really the right word. Instead, I'd rather the vows say something like submit. Submit. After all, to obey someone is to submit to them, right? And the word submit is more biblically appropriate. Second, the original writers of the marriage liturgy were men. They were men. So they took the first few verses, those couple of verses in Ephesians 5, out of context and focused only where Paul says wives should submit to their husbands as they do the Lord. These guys didn't want to read the next few verses, did they? Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In other words, husband, love your wives like Christ loves the church and be willing to give yourself, your whole self, even your life, for her, just as Christ surrendered himself and submitted even unto death for our sake, do so for your wife. 
But even in that context, do you think the bride would have wanted to say submit? Even if the husband, the groom, said submit as well? I doubt it. I'm not sure either of them would have been happy. And that's simply because we don't like this idea. It runs against everything we are taught as Americans. Submitting to someone, surrendering to something is contrary to who we are. We're taught to be independent, to stand on our own two feet. Individualism is key to who we are as Americans. But what about us Christians? The Bible teaches the opposite. Scripture says the only way to find true freedom is through surrender. Submission, submitting ourselves to Jesus and to his ways are the only way. That is the only way to experience God's gift of salvation. But this requires change, doesn't it? That's sometimes even worse than submission. But this Lenten season, we've been wrestling with God's call to surrender those parts of our lives that we have not allowed him to fully live in. In particular, we've talked about surrendering space and time and control and the best of what we have. But one thing we haven't talked about is our past. Something we like to hold on to with vice grip like strength. Other times, though, our past hold on to us. And when, we, when past decisions and past mistakes cling to us like barnacles on a boat, it makes it even more difficult to change. But when we are willing to let go of our past and all the baggage found there and give it to God, it's amazing the kind of transformation and freedom God offers to us in return. I believe that's what we see in Jacob's story this morning. If you remember, Jacob was the grandson of Abraham, and he became known as a deceiver because he cheated his brother Esau out of his inheritance and his father's blessing. Jacob misled his father, tricked him really into giving him Esau's birthright. So Jacob had to run away from home to avoid his brother who was on the warpath. While on the run, Jacob met and married his, his wives and he began a family. But before long, he returned to his deceiving ways. He manipulated a situation with, with his father-in-law, Laban, for his own gain, taking his family and all of his possessions while Laban was out of town shearing sheep. Which means, once again, Jacob has run away from home. This time, though, Laban showed Jacob mercy and offered to forgive him. But it's on the heels of this reconciliation that Jacob sent word to his estranged brother. It was finally time to face his past. But that's easier said than done, isn't it? Rather than face the consequences of our decisions and behavior, those actions that often leave a trail of destruction behind us, we try to negotiate a settlement, don't we? Whatever we can do to avoid the pain that we've caused and the consequences of our actions. Jacob was the same way. He was ready to face Esau, but he wasn't ready to face the sins of his past. He sent word to his brother to meet but he tried to skirt that damage he did by telling his brother that he wasn't hiding. He wasn't trying to take anything else from him. And on top of that, Jacob had the audacity to suggest that they just forget the past and move on. But the truth is, forgetting the past is not the same, same thing as facing the past. It's circumventing the consequences, the deadly consequences of our sin. But it wasn't just in his daily life that Jacob refused to fully surrender. This inability to submit and give his past to God had bled over into his prayer life, too. Verses 9 through 12 tell us that Jacob begged God, begged and pleaded with God to save him from the wrath of his brother. You see, Jacob knew. He knew deep down that he needed to face these consequences, that he deserved these consequences but he didn't repent of his sin. He just continued to carry this heavy burden instead of turning it over to God. He was still, at least at that very moment, completely unwilling to face his past. 
The good news is we serve a God who is faithful and just, who is ready to forgive and willing to receive us if we're just willing, ready to confess our sins. We don't have to carry around the weight of our past. I think about every time that we've moved, the moving company sends me a final invoice that lists the final weight of all of our stuff. And every move, we've now been in six houses, with each move, that final tonnage has ballooned. We just have junk that goes to stuff that we don't even have anymore. Cables and wires and all manner of, of stupid stuff. But do we get rid of it? Heck no. We have clothes that don't fit, boxes we haven't opened in 10 years. Do we give it to the church garage sale? Of course not. We just hold on to it. We keep carrying that weight year after year from house to house. It's the same way with our sins. They just keep piling up day after day after day because we refuse to repent. We refuse to allow the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us and to make us like Jesus. Rather than pursuing holiness and surrendering our past and submitting our futures to God, we just keep hoarding all that garbage that fills up our hearts. But God offers to take it all, to lighten our load and to free us from the burdens that continually push us into the ground. But for Jacob, all that changed one night on the banks of the Jabbok. He had already sent his family across the river, and there in isolation, Jacob encountered God. Perhaps it's easier to think about this in this famous scene in terms of wrestling with your thoughts in the middle of the night, tossing and turning, unable to shake the mistakes of your past. For someone with chronic anxiety like me, you can recall nearly every mistake you've ever made. That dumb thing you said in third grade, let's replay it on a loop at 2 a.m. Yeah, I can do that. It haunts you and keeps you awake. It's like a song that you can't get out of your head. That's kind of what it was like for Jacob, except this deceiver, this manipulator, wrestled with something much more powerful than something stupid I did in third grade. He wrestled with the identity of his past in the form of a man, the angel of the Lord who is the pre-incarnate Christ. In the dark, he found himself alone, but with God himself, not, he's not alone, but with God in the flesh. Jacob had lived his life putting his own desires first. He had wanted his brother's inheritance, so he took it. He wanted Rachel as his wife. So he refused to release her father from the obligation. Now he wanted to be free of this burden of sin against his brother, but he wouldn't be able to get freedom on his own. He would have to put God first, place God's will above his will, and surrender his personal strength and abilities to God. Just like Jacob, we cannot be free to be used by God until we surrender to him and submit to his ways. I once had a pastor tell me, it's not whether or not God has a plan for our lives. Instead, it's whether God has your life for his plan. And that's the God's honest truth. We can't be used by him if he's not first in our lives. And it's only there in that living relationship that we can be free of our past sins. After wrestling with that man all night, we read in verse 25 that he could not overpower Jacob, despite Jacob being 97 years old. But this is not because Jacob, because the Lord lacked power over Jacob. Clearly, the Lord did have the power because with a touch, he wrenched Jacob's hip out of socket and brought Jacob to his knees, which is exactly where Jacob needed to be. This is exactly where we need to be, too. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord, before we find our place, our hips, something in our lives being wrenched. 
But at this point, though, Jacob, Jacob went from pushing this man away to grasping him, grasping onto him, holding onto him. God would not force Jacob to humble himself, but he wanted Jacob to surrender on his own. Jacob went from fighting God to clinging to him with both hands. There in the sacred space, Jacob surrendered himself his past and his present. He surrendered his identity and God changed it all. Verse 28 tells us that the man, God, said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob was changed because he accepted God's authority over his life. Jacob had to lose in order to win. He had to surrender in order to be saved. Jacob had been carrying all that baggage of his past, the burdens of his sin. God wanted to use Jacob, but he needed Jacob to be freed first. Jacob had to release the the baggage of his past. You know, in his book, uh, Just Like Jesus, Max Lucado says this, God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. Only by Jacob facing his past could God free him and use him as a witness, a witness of God's transforming power. This is the case time and time again in the Bible, including with people like Paul and Moses. They had to face the sins of their past so God could use them as his witnesses. The same is true with us. We have to face our past so God can free us and use us for his glory. But as the sun rose that morning, Jacob faced his brother. And instead of anger and wrath that he expected, Esau embraced him. After all that, it was joy that Jacob received when he was finally released from his past. And because of his experience, Jacob built an altar, a a sacred space to remember his encounter with God. Instead of keeping God at arm's length, instead of Jacob trying to be his own God, this altar was a witness to the change in his life. And now Jacob embraced the Lord with both arms. He called this altar in English, the God of Israel. Jacob surrendered. He submitted to God and gave God authority over his life. This is our calling today, too. To throw ourselves, our whole selves, our past, present, and future at the feet of Jesus. He and he alone is the Lord. And he refuses to be Lord over just part of your life. Instead, we're called to give it all to him. Including the sins of our past and the burdens we carry. He wants nothing more than to transform us into his image to give us the gifts of joy and freedom and salvation. So what will it take? What will it take for you to surrender your past today? To kneel before the Lord of Lords. Are you willing to release the heavy load you carry and grab hold of Jesus with both hands? Because he will transform you as you surrender to him. So submit to Christ as the Lord of your life and experience the freedom that he offers. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.